Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. In this, well, <laughs> I guess, first fully news, um, not on Twitter episode. But boy, we have some interesting stuff for you now. Let's start with the fact that uh, there was an interesting conflict going on on various social media, mostly through Telegram channels, between my buddy Prigozhin, hi Mr. Prigozhin, together with all your trolls, and our buddy Igor Girkin. And at one point, even Gerasimov uh, plopped in, like, a, a bunch of people plopped in, Dmitry Rogozin also showed its head, it was crazy. But the gist of it, and this is why I also hadn't made previous news apps, because I wanted this to finish up, is that um, Prigozhin, just like Russia's threats about literally everything, well, um, he just lost a bunch of influence, and it seems that his his days of political power are waning, so to speak, at least from what we see recently. See, what happened was, is that Girkin, in his usual triads about how he is the only person who fully knows everything that's going on and all that stuff, well, in his usual manner, by criticizing Prigozhin, he called the leader of Wagner Group a servant and a criminal, and a common criminal, basically. Prisluga, well, Prisluga i Ugolovnik. Ugolovnik is kind of like a person who's sitting, who's, who has sat in cri- prison for criminal charges, and Prisluga is kind of like manservants of the nobility. So, you know, a bit of nuance here, but I think servant and a criminal reports it best. And then Prigozhin got, you know, a bit active. See, he had been, you know, smacked on the head a bit recently because... You know, he, he started poking out too much, because Prigozhin himself criticizes everyone around him, including Gerasimov and all these people. And he, Putin had apparently poked him and told him that, hey, buddy, that's a bit too much of criticizing my important institutions. So Prigozhin took this one to heart, and in a very blatant way, called Girkin a pussy and a weakling, and told him that, hey, if you want to fight, come, come join Wagner Group. Of course, you won't be giving a command post first, but come join Wagner Group. And that was supposed to be an intimidation tactic. And Girkin, being himself, being as crazy, as maniacal as he is, you know, I think Prigozhin thought Girkin would say no. But no, no, no. Our buddy Girkin said, okay, of course, just make me a formal, uh, a formal kind of invitation. This isn't done through Telegram and all that stuff. And then he was apparently called by one of Prigozhin's men. And... Although Girkin stated that, well, yes, we had a civil conversation, and although I've said a bunch of things about this guy who called me in the past, and he said a bunch of things about me, well, you know, we'll sort this one out. But the problem is, Prigozhin was kind of irritated about this, because, yeah, he made Girkin sort of look a bit weak, because Girkin switched his polite side on. Well, Prigozhin would have to deal with Girkin being in Wagner Group, and Girkin wouldn't keep his mouth shut if stuff would go wrong. So again, Prigozhin decided that the best way of, out of this is would be to release publicly a very stupid, stupid statement. Where he basically stated publicly that, ah, but once, Frig- once Girkin arrives in uh, the Wagner Group offices, well, then we shall put him in front of the tribunal of our, of our leaders, and, and then we, he will be asked very serious questions about, you know, money being laundered and all that whatnot, whatnot you know, how he has stolen money from Donbass while he was in charge there, and, and all this, basically, and, and all this in prison slang with a lot of bleeps in over every version of the text that I've heard so far. And he did it in a way to basically publicly announce that if Girkin actually arrives, then, you know, he'll be probably tortured, maybe meet, you know, meet the best buddy of Wagner Group, the Sledgehammer, which is quite interesting. But but yeah, after that, Girkin obviously, well, backed down, but he backed down in a way that made Prigozhin look like a crazy person, because then he just stated that, hey, look, well, you know, this, this whole recording is public, and uh, Prigozhin do- does not alone speak politely, he just blatantly is afraid of me and doesn't do doesn't do stuff. If he's so strong, well, let, let him come. Come at me, bro, man. I'm here in Moscow, but I'm not gonna go there after all this nonsense that you've said. And nothing. And nothing. And Prigozhin just lets Girkin, you know, be in with this. This whole thing is over. And now it turns out that Prigozhin might threaten people with sledgehammers, but delivering upon them is um, not always not always possible. And tied into this is that we have more people who have deserted from Wagner Group, who have escaped. And, uh, well, interestingly enough, you know, Prigozhin in his Wagner Group promised the prisoners that if they would serve six months, 
in, in the Russian army, then they would be pardoned and all that whatnot. Well, it turns out, according to Russian law, and they're trying to, you know, squeeze through the law and all that whatnot, turns out that uh, it's not as, as it seems, since everyone, as it has, you know, we, we've discovered, everyone who's been taken from these prisons has been pardoned day one since they joined Wagner Group, because you can't simply take someone out of Russia's prison without pardoning them. So there's a ton of presidential pardons, and I, I really, really think that, you know, some sort of pro-Putinist human rights defender is going to go out and say, well, yeah, sure, we have 98.9% guilty verdicts in all courts, but just look at how many people we have pardoned. That number is like over like 35,000 people or something who are all just into Wagner Group, but, you know, be wary of this. Anyhow, if you're if you desert and run away from this army, and there's a presidential pardon on you, on you already, then one of these guys actually, you know, ran to his home village, and we have reports from him, he's hiding and running around Siberia now. Tough luck finding the dude with the sledgehammer, because that's the only thing he's afraid now. But according to the law, well, yes, he appears in all of his papers as already having received presidential pardon. Now, that kind of complicates things if you think about it, because right now there's a massive new wave of people signing up for Wagner. There's like a mass of guys wanting to do this, which happens, you know, only after these things. I am starting to think that the veteran criminal people, veteran, cr veteran criminals, uh, out of whom many are murderers and rapists and all that whatnot, and don't believe people who say that, no, 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 they crossed their T's and whatnot, that was one of the things that, you know, was thrown at me in the conversation in, in Twitter spaces that <laughs> afterwards got me in trouble. But no, no, they pick up terrorists, criminals and murderers and thieves. And um, yeah, the, the, the pro-Russian side is attempting to whitewash these guys, but you know, whatever. The thing is, yeah, they're not joining because they now know that, hey, as soon as they join, they'll get insta-part. And, and if, they can avo if they can avoid Prigozhin's, you know, <laughs> sledgehammer, then they're free people. And Prigozhin is kind of preoccupied. He's not going to run after everybody. <laughs> like, I just imagine him uh, appointing special squads to go into deep Siberia for all this situation. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> they found a loophole. And, uh, well, obviously, I'm quite curious as to where, where this will go. Since, yeah, that's a bit of a weakness there, isn't it? Also, in other news about the tanks, I was quite sad that... Um, that, yeah, the United States is lagging with, with their tank deliveries, and turns out Spain's Leopards aren't in working condition. A bit weird. And I don't know, I've, I've also been into, into conversations with people. I was on, on um, Mr. Heaton's political podcast, Sedentum, recently. By the way, as the day this comes out, uh, finally the episode with me and John Michael Gaudier is going to come out on his channel where I talk about how this war has impacted science, especially in in Russia, because I got contacted by those guys. It was recorded a long time ago, it's just that he had a lot of sponsored episodes he needed to run, and, and that's coming out as well. But what really strike, strikes me as odd is that a lot of people, and I've, I've read this in a lot of comments, I, I don't think a lot of people actually believe Ukraine can win this. Meanwhile, um, I'm, I've, I'm so deep into this that I simply can't actually see ways how Russia could win this. So maybe we're coming from different perspectives here, but I personally believe that the deal is impossible. And like I said on Heaton's show, when because I tried to, you know, take a perspective off, because he's one of those people who thinks that the United States should offer a peace deal. And I went on to the side saying that at the end, yeah, may maybe the US should try to offer a peace deal. Now, from my position, that would be declined instantly by the Russian side, since how they absolutely hate, <laughs> hate everything American, and that would be a suicidal thing if any such offer would be taken, but then, you know, then at least that would shut the mouths of all those pro-war guys. But, but yeah, this is kind of, kind of weird. I do believe that truly arming Ukraine and allowing Ukrainian army to win as quickly as possible would be the best way to go. Because, again, I don't know, do these people think this, this is going to stop with Ukraine? Because I, I honestly don't think so. For example, literally today, in an interview with Russia Today... Uh, basically, he was interviewed by Dmitry Kisilyov from Russia Today. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said that the West has, quote-unquote, got its sights on Moldova as a country that might, quote-unquote, follow Ukraine's path by turning into an anti-Russia. 
And Lavrov's insinuations, especially about President Maya Sandu and her alleged desire to join NATO, obviously were met with extreme criticism from Moldova's foreign ministry. The spokesman, the spokesper, the spokesman Daniel Voda uh, underscored how familiar and threatening Lavrov's language sounded. He tweeted, quote, It is clear that Lavrov's statements are part of the already well-known threatening rhetoric of Russia's diplomacy. And, you know, obviously, Putin and other Russian officials have often used similar words to justify the invasion of Ukraine by presenting, presenting Ukraine as anti-Russia. And uh, Moldova's foreign ministry representative Voda tweeted, quote, we would like to remind the Russian side that the path the Moldova uh, is taking is the path of joining the European Union. This is a choice supported by our citizens. Moldovans, regardless of political or geopolitical preferences, want peace, freedom and democracy. We will appreciate all, that all countries of the world, including Russia, respect this, this decision for our people. Moldova has clearly chosen its future, and its future is to be a part of the free world. And that's, that's an important thing, because again, Andrzej Duda, the Polish president, is right now in Riga, and he also said in the speech that, yeah, for, for every one of us who's been into this side of, of the Iron Curtain, that was also another thing, the other side of the Iron Curtain, one of the taglines of, uh, of my show before, before happiness is mandatory to completely over, is the fact that, yeah, you know, Soviet era and Soviet achievements were in large part only achieved because of sheer exploitation of all the, of all the so-called friendly rep republics and everyone surrounding them. Russia did not really develop much. They exploited our workforce for their own military gains and everything. And everyone who wasn't Russian was basically a second-rate citizen. None of us here, and I speak for the majority of people, there are definitely some very nostalgic minority, but it is what it is. None of us here see this Russian world, Ruski Mir, as anything but a return to slavery and poverty. <laughs> no one's really happy or anything. Because re returning to this Russian world and Russian worldview, yeah, we... I'm sorry, but it's completely completely against every fiber of my nature when someone says, we should take Putin's interests into account. No, you should not. You should beat him like a dog that he is. And he, like I said, is those people with prison mentality and he will sniff weakness like an angry bloodhound and he will bite. The only way how to, how to defeat Putin and how to make him even listen and barely adhere to anything even remotely remotely re reminiscing of civilization is to take him behind the be behind the shed and put a nice bullet in his skull and that's a bit brutal but then again i've been banned from twitter already on the and and uh, youtube is demonetizing everything that i do and this is my podcast <laughs> what else am i gonna do now not be angry when some people are trying to do this and, and like when people don't understand why it's paramount that Russia loses this lose this war. It's not enough to make peace. Russia must lose this or there will be no peace. Russia's just going to recoup its strengths and there's going to be another war 10 years from now. Russia's going to come up with another brilliant reason why to basically invade another country. And, you know, making deals will just lead to, you know, more nepotism. For example, today, another important person out of my people whom I wish to see dead list Ramzan Kadyrov made another interesting, cool thing. Because you see, Hamzat Kadyrov, Ramzan Kadyrov's 26-year-old nephew, has been appointed deputy prime minister for private property and real estate in Chechnya. This appointment was announced by Ramzan Kadyrov himself, who described his nephew Hamzat as talented and reliable leader who proved himself in his previous government jobs. In February 2020, this same guy was appointed Chechnya's minister of sport. At the time, he was 23 years old. At the time, Ramzan Kadyrov explained the appointment as appropriate for a grandson of Ahmad Kadyrov. And that's just quite crazy. According to Chechen's governor, Chechen governor's official website, Hamzat Kadyrov stepped down from that post in August 2021, and then he, in September 2022, traveled to the self-proclaimed Donetsk Republic to visit the Chechen fighters deployed there. And yeah, this is about crazy. In 2018, BBC Russian News calculated that 30% of Chechnya's 158 senior official, officials were members of the Kadyrov family. Another 23% were natives of Ramzan Kadyrov's community, and 12% of the pool were Kadyrov's friends and, and their own relatives. So, like, 
65% of every official of the important ones, 65% of these are literally run by, um, by Ramzan Gudov's family. And let me remind you that last year Kadyrov appointed his 22-year-old daughter, Aishat, as the Republic's culture minister. Nepotism has never known such high levels where it could reach. Corruption is beyond an art form. This, this is, this is what the, these people say that, you know, people who want Ukraine to surrender and, and, and who want all this happen. This, this is the world that they want to live in. I mean, seriously, you know, go, go and support corruption and all this stuff. And then people state that, you know, so this is some sort of a progressive regime that fights against, you know, evil West. Just look at their own nepotism numbers and how corrupt they are. Only people who've been thoroughly, thoroughly brainwashed could even find, say something positive. And, you know, to finalize this a bit, on the front lines, um, the Ukrainian side around Bakhmut has been moved, moved back a bit. And the Wagner group have literally taken a... Um, well, it's technically a village, but I wouldn't call it that way because it's literally two houses in which three people live, and that's not an understatement or overstatement. Literally, three people live in that tiny little small place, who's who's, which is so ins insignificant that I don't didn't even bother looking the name up. I just saw the photo because, of course, that is a photo. And Wagner Group proudly presents as their achievement of taking some bumblefuck middle of nowhere where three people used to live, and they took a picture in in front of the only house that was only partially destroyed because everything else is basically destroyed. So right now, the greatest achievement Russian army can present to us to this day is, you know, besides heavy fighting in Bakhmut, which isn't succeeding for them at all, is the taking of literally a barn door somewhere. Congratulations, comrades. Congratulations indeed. But yeah, we're back with the news. And uh, since the banning of Twitter and understanding that there's a bunch of stupid people out there who truly need an education on this situation, a bit more cynical than usual. Slightly more aggressive, always a sharp. Since, well, I was told that, and made understand that, I, I guess, I guess I kind of represent the B generation, the last remnant of here in the post USSR sphere, since being a fan of Hunter S. Thompson and William S. Burroughs and Kurt Vonnegut and all these people. Fun times. Just gonna do my work and, uh, right now, settling the whole paperwork to get back to Ukraine. This is a bit. A bit silly at this point. I, I, I need to go back and I hope that I'll be able to do that in early March. But that's it for today. Do svidanya, tovarishi. And thanks to all of you who support me on Patreon. Really matters a lot, especially since after I lost my Twitter account. And um, thank you for listening. And if you want to become our patrons, go to the eastern border. Go to the patreon.com slash the eastern border. Or if you want to make a one-time donation, go to the eastern border.lv and click the donate button there. It will be much appreciated and you'll make my days easier. And I'll try to bring some more, a bit more snarky, but very necessary news to all of you. Happiness is mandatory. <laughs>